Dr. Umar Johnson, how are we doing today, sir? It was well, sir. Thanks for having me on the show. Great, great. You've been here before, and uh, we had such a great time with a lot of information the last time you was on the show. How you been, man? I've been doing pretty good. Um, I'm happy to announce that we finally purchased uh, two schools with the money that we raised over the past five years. And in Wilmington, Delaware, we now have the Frederick yes. Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. Uh, oh I want to thank the brothers and sisters across uh, the state of Oklahoma, the Midwest, the Central South, because we received a lot of donations from Oklahoma. And I want oh, to send man. a special thank you to the brothers and sisters in that state for helping us realize our goal. Well, man, that is fantastic, that is man. May, hopefully you can encourage more people uh, to open up schools across this nation. There mm-hmm. are much needed schools, yes. you know, for uh, young people. Without question. Um, and although we've acquired the school, we're not done because we have to renovate the school. Uh, there's some mm-hmm. work that has to be done. We have four buildings, which includes two school buildings, the Honorable Marcus Garvey Building and the Honorable Frederick Douglass Building. We need $1 million to restore the entire campus, all four buildings. But if we can get half of that, we can restore two of the buildings. And if we can get a quarter of that, 250000 we can at least restore the Honorable Marcus Garvey Building, which is the smaller of the two, which would allow us to go ahead and get started with educating our young men next summer of 2020. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. So how can uh, yeah. the listeners donate? Yeah. What process do they need to do in order to donate to your cause over there? Uh, two ways to donate. One is through check or money or the mail-in, which has been the primary way that we've received most of our donations. Uh, we're no longer using uh, the Cash App uh, because there's mm-hmm. been too many problems with the Cash App. And now okay. the answers coming from the Cash App as to why. Uh, People are having so much trouble donating or we're having so much trouble switching the money over to the school account. So the only way to donate now is through mail, check or money order payable to FDMG Academy, P.O. Box 9634, Wilmington, Delaware. I repeat, P.O. Box 9634, Wilmington, Delaware, 19809. The other way to donate to bring your check or money order payable to the FDMG Academy to either the upcoming lecture in Tulsa, Oklahoma, November 2nd at the Greenwood Cultural Center or the very next day, Sunday, November 3rd in Oklahoma City at the 4502 Event Center. They could bring their donations when they come for the lectures. Mm-hmm. Now, you've been traveling all over this globe, man, and I know you have, your schedule is busy and, and finding time to rest is, can be kind of difficult for you. So how do you handle it, man? I mean, uh, you just steadily going. Well, I love what I do. That's the one half. And the other half is I believe I was born to do what I'm doing. So because I love what I do, that takes a lot of the stress out of the work. And then also believing that I was born to do what I'm doing takes Mm -hmm. away from the frustrations and some of the pitfalls that can uh, arise when you're doing this type of work. So that's what keeps me focused. Um, You know, I came to consciousness uh, not by an accident, not because I got shut out of corporate America. I came to consciousness as a young child ever since my first black history class at Mead Elementary School in 18th and Oxford North Philadelphia, I've never looked back. So I've always Mm -hmm. been about this work since I was a fourth grader. Well, that's uh, good to know. So now you still reside in Philadelphia, correct? Correct. Correct. And uh, how things going? I know there were, I've been in Philadelphia and I, man, hey, it's a beautiful city and a lot of history there. And uh, how are things going there as far as systematically? controlling of the system. You understand what I'm trying to say? Well, black Philadelphia isn't doing very well. We have one of the highest murder rates in the country at present. In addition to that, we are the number one most quickly gentrified city. We are the, uh, how do you say this, of all cities that are undergoing gentrification, 
Philadelphia is number one in the rate of that gentrification. We overtook San Francisco and Seattle for the first place. So Mm. blacks are being pushed out of the inner city of Philadelphia more than any other place in this country. And a lot of that has to do with the black bourgeoisie of Philadelphia. For those who don't know, the Boule, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, the secret society of black male elitist Negroes was founded in the city of Philadelphia. We also have the largest black Masonic temple here and the second largest Masonic temple in the world. So Philadelphia has a lot of secret power, both white and Negro, and that secret power dominates the political and economic spectrum. Philadelphia is a city where you can't rise unless you're given permission to rise from either the black bourgeoisie or the white power structure. So if you look at me, for example, I would never be known around the world. My work would have been lost to history had it not been for brothers and sisters outside of Philadelphia recognizing Mm. the things that I was doing. It would have never been done in Philadelphia. Philadelphia knew what I was doing, but because I was not a Mason, I was not a Greek, I was not gay, I was not a part of any clique, and because of that, there was no introduction me. And in this city, someone needs to vouch for you in order for you to rise. So for me, I was uh, brought out outside of Philly and then welcomed back into Philadelphia, meaning that a lot of people didn't even know that I was from Philly. Even now, people are surprised to find out that this is where I was born, raised, and still live. Wow, wow. man, that is uh, – <laughs> Is that kind of common in certain uh, cities where there are concentrated blacks, or is that just, you know, something that's systematic? Philadelphia is probably an extreme example because this is America's first free black community. Um, It's one of the so-called more progressive cities. And by progressive, what I mean by that terminology is it's one of the cities where the elitist Negro has more progressively kept the masses of black people uh, politically disorganized and intellectually backward. That's what progress means to me. We do a better job of controlling our Negroes than do other cities. For example, if Michael Brown happened in Philadelphia, there would have been no riot. If Freddie Gray happened in Philadelphia, there would have been no riot. The black Mm. churches and the black politicians and the black community leaders in this city, they run the black masses. So you look at a Baltimore, you look at a Ferguson, Missouri, the youth were not afraid. The working class Africans were not afraid. Even the young professionals were not afraid. That would Mm -hmm. not be the case here in Philadelphia. Now, I would say the youth are not afraid. They're not. But unfortunately, they have not been very well politicized in this city. But as far as the young black professionals, they are very much under the control of the black bourgeoisie. You know, most of them, uh, you wouldn't even think that, I mean, being in Oklahoma, I would think that uh, Philadelphia was kind of like an aggressive black city. I don't you know, and that's what I thought it was. I mean, that where yeah, you know, a lot of stuff. in the days of Georgie Woods, you know, and other communities, mm-hmm. Cecil B. Moore, you know, mm-hmm. go back to the '60s, we had a very progressive Black Panther move, uh, movement, very progressive Black arts movement. Yes, it was once that, but in the post Dr. King assassination era. Philadelphia has become a bastion for black bourgeoisie control. Mm. Wow. wow. So what can what can they do up there in Philadelphia to change the narrative of that image? Is it is it is it too late or is it something that you got to work on? Well, with respect to that question, I think the answer applies to black America in general. And for me, the two things that black America must begin to do, and there's many things, but two essential critical things that black America must begin to do to change the direction to which we're headed. And let me be clear, that direction is extermination, to change, to make a detour from that planned agenda of the United States government. We're going to have to get into education and economics. Education Mm -hmm. is about preparing the children in the art of leadership and community development. Mm -hmm. Economics is the ability to build community infrastructure 
and employ members of your own community. See, one, one of the reasons why black people have more coons and more sellouts amongst us nationally than any other group is because we're the only group that does not systematically employ and empower our own. Chinese yeah. employ and empower their own. Mexicans mm-hmm. employ and empower their own. Jews, Anglo-Saxons, East Indians, Latino, they employ and empower their own systematically, not just a few jobs here and a few jobs there, but systematically the youth of every other ethnic community in this country can go to their own people for an opportunity. Blacks cannot do that. In fact, we're probably the only people in America who does not offer opportunities and resources to their own. That's why it's so easy for our young people to turn their back on us. It's so easy for our older people to turn their back on us because a community that is not self-sustaining is a community without respect. Mm. And, and, and Dr. Umar, don't you think that also the reason that we are having such a hard time coming together and having that village and, and helping one another as we did in the past, this government seems to systematically tear us apart mentally as far as not giving us the same opportunities. You know, I, Bobby always says, you know, black folk, we need to stop putting our hands out and we need to start helping each other and, and learning the basics. Young people now, it, it's hard to find a young person that even knows how to change a tire on a car. But until, do you think that, I mean, what can we do as a people to bring that that togetherness again and and still fight that that system that's in place to keep us to keep us oppressed, to keep us down, not giving us the same opportunity. The government has an extermination agenda. We know that. The problem Mm -hmm. is black America has no agenda at all. Right Mm -hmm. now, this is probably the first time in four hundred years which we just commemorated two weeks ago, August 21st, at Nat Turner Land in Virginia. But this is probably the first time in 400 years that black America is without an undisputed identified leader. You don't have that. That is good and it is bad. It is good because for the first time, the grassroots is able to put forth leadership that it selects itself, leadership that is uncompromising, authentic, visionary and sincere. That's the good side. The not so good side is that the government is also aware that black America right now has a leadership vacuum. And the reason black America has a leadership black vacuum is twofold. On the one hand, the wave of police genocide that capped black America during the Obama years exposed traditional black leaders such as Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, the Congressional Black Caucus, the NAACP, the Urban League, as having no solutions for us. So ironically, police genocide exposed the ineffectiveness of black leadership. So the Reverend Al Sharpton was disinvited from Baltimore. He was disinvited from Charleston, South Carolina, after the murder of Walter Scott. Black America wanted nothing to do with him because he had no solution. See, praying and voting does not stop police from killing black people. So the police Mm. genocide exposed the fact that the only two weapons that the black bourgeoisie has to offer poor blacks is votes and prayers, and neither one are sufficient to end police genocide. That's how the traditional black leadership cartel was outed. The problem for the white power structure, there are no black bourgeoisie in America that can capture the face and the attention of the black youth. See, this is the first time you don't have a black person. Michael Eric Dyson can't hold their attention. Mark Lamont Hill can't hold their attention. Cornell right. Young can't hold their attention. Roland mm-hmm. Martin can't hold anybody's attention. They don't have anyone that they can put out there and have the youth follow. Because of that, you are seeing the rise of the black athlete and entertainer. Mm-hmm. As now being the spokesman, the government is now using the people our children love to now be their spokesperson. It's effective, but it's also dangerous. And it's effective because they listen to the rappers. They love the athletes. So if you choose rappers and athletes to be the new leaders, they can continue to keep the youth dumb, deaf, and blind. But it's also dangerous 
because someone like Dr. Umar Johnson would come along and expose the rappers and athletes as coons as well. No different than the leaders that we outed. I'm simply saying that we're going to have to go to war with our athletes and entertainers. They're going to have to be exposed as the new coons. Nah, new coons. And that's what it is. You know, when you have a bunch of uh, bourgeois, what I call bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie. Uh, Negroes and stuff who are out here cooning and stuff mm-hmm. who are afraid to talk to a homeless person, a black homeless person or uh, holding up that Trump sign, yeah, the only little black uh, spot behind it. Yeah, and all of that kind of stuff. And they are, they see, when I always say when uh, Negroes get $2 past bus fare, mm. you know, they think that they have really arrived and, you know, they separate themselves and they, some of them were born in the hood you know, raised in the hood, and then they don't even know, they don't go back to the hood. That's right. You know, they don't know their friends. Because we do not socialize our children to be loyal to community. Once again, just like we're the only ethnic group that does not employ its own, we're also the only ethnic group that does not socialize its children to be loyal to its community. When you're raised in the Chinese-American community, you're taught loyalty. Race Mm -hmm. first. When you're raised in an East Indian community, you're taught loyalty. Race first. When you're raised in an African-American Negro community, you're taught to be loyal to Jesus, loyal to Muhammad, loyal to the United States government, loyal to your fraternity, loyal to your sorority, loyal to your Masonic lodge. And I'm not, I don't have anything against the Masons. I have heroes who are Masons, but my point is these elitist black organizations who ain't really doing anything of significance to black folk, they are the ones that hold our loyalty. Being loyal to the black community has not been a priority for any of us since the assassination of Dr. King. We have been 51 years with a sustained, mass, comprehensive movement for political, economic, or social change by black folk. And that's dangerous because it means that our children are one of the first generations of black children who, number one, not only did not experience the black power struggle, but unlike myself, who was in my 40s, at least I had grandparents and uncles who lived through it. These children not only did not experience, they don't even know anyone who lived through it. So being proud to be black and standing up with a black power agenda, as far as they're concerned, that could have happened as long ago as did the building of the pyramids. Man, that's uh, you, that, you're so right on that, man. Because some of the young people, I had a guy the other day, and uh, I asked him. I said, "Hey, man, do you know uh, about Black Wall Street?" He couldn't tell me nothing. He was thirty something years old from Tulsa. From Tulsa, he born and raised here, and he could not tell me because I don't think we're educated enough, man. We don't have a lot of knowledge, mm-hmm. and those parents are not pushing information down to their children inside those homes, you know, the village has been destroyed. And it's like uh, technology has made a lot of younger people not, you know, they're not social, you know, they're not social at all. Dr. King prophesied that, by the way, the good Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was the last leader of a mass movement by black folks. uh, He prophesied that the evolution of technology would serve to separate black people more effectively. Now we don't have to come under the same roof to meet. We can do a teleconference. Now yes. we don't have to come face to face to meet. We can do Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, MySpace. So the one mm-hmm. thing that black people need to learn how to do, which is work together as one, we not, we not only do not know how to do that, we're now, it's popular not to do that because every network that we're a part of does not require face to face dialogue and exchange. For example, mm-hmm. YouTube killed the study group in the black community. If you remember going from the 60s all the way up to Y2K, the study group was the thing. Right here in Philadelphia, for me, being a member of the UNIA, the Marcus Garvey movement, we had a study group once a night. Okay, that's where we learned our Garveyism. Well, guess what? Once YouTube came on the scene, the study groups across the country have died. And what people need to understand about the study group was that they served to help us get to know one another. They serve to help us forge a collective consciousness. The study group also helped the leaders pick out the people who they could trust. Because when you're studying together and meeting on a regular basis with the free exchange of energy and ideas, 
you can begin to figure people out. So the study group was a very effective and necessary aspect of military science and black organizational science. It's dead now. Mm -hmm. It is. It it most definitely is. You know, Mm -hmm. that information needs to go down, go back Mm -hmm. down. Because, see, I think African-Americans, as what they call us, uh, I think that uh, we just don't have enough today's knowledge. If some of the older generation have died off, these kids are growing up just not knowing. It's mm-hmm. kind of like a, but they are our products, though. See, the yeah, children no. were created by the community. Not even their parents exclusively can be blamed. The black community is totally responsible for the gangster rap generation. We're mm-hmm. totally responsible for the black on black crime rate that are sweeping the inner cities. We're totally responsible for the single mothers and the te- and the teenage parents team. Yes. The government introduced all of those problems I just named, but mm-hmm. we have not sought to do anything to address those problems. So although we did not create them, we are totally guilty of not addressing them. A minute ago, you mentioned Black Wall Street. Well, guess mm-hmm. what? That's the solution. Black Wall Street, which is just a metaphor for the African village. Black Wall Street and the African village are one in the same. That means what? A self-sustaining black mm-hmm. community that educates its own, employs its own, invests yeah. in its own. What are the four major institutions of any community? A bank to invest in the community, a supermarket mm-hmm. to feed mm-hmm. the life of the community, a school to educate the youth of the community, and a hospital to save the lives of those in your community. Oh, that's you that's can great. name a black community in America right now including the middle-class bourgeoisie communities, you can't name one of them that has all four of those essential institutions owned by black people within the same town. And that is embarrassing. And the reason wow. it's embarrassing is because we are a $2 trillion people, $2 trillion. We spend $2 billion on Jordans every year, $4 billion on alcohol, $1 billion on McDonald's, Nearly mm. twenty billion on weave and perms. We buy twice the Mercedes Benz is sold in America than white folks, although we have less than a third of white America's wealth. So we have to look at ourselves because we as a people don't care enough about the future of our community and we definitely don't care about the children. I say it all the time. I should have never had to write psychoacademic holocaust. I should have never had to write the work the book I'm working on now. Black Parent Advocate. I should have never had to become a school psychologist. Why not? Because the black community should have its own schools. You mean to tell me only one out of every four black boy graduates in this country? Two out of every four will end up in prison? Three out of every four will end up on psychiatric medication? Seven out of ten will be referred for special education? At least three out of eight will be arrested in school for some ridiculous offense that didn't even require handcuffs? But yet and still, we have almost no independent schools in this country. White folks don't care about black children, but neither do black people. Mm. Wow, that's scary, man. Yeah, that's that's scary. real scary to, you know, come up, you know, and, and that's reality. This is what's and going we keep on. asking, how do we change this? How do we change this? How do we change that's this? That's always a change the mindset. It all begins in the mind. People used to come up to me when we started raising the money for FDMG, and they would say, Dr. Umar, why are you about to put $750,000 into a school? You need to put that into jobs. You need to put that into weapons so we can build community defense. You need to put that into businesses to hire people. And I said, stop. I could put that $750,000 into businesses right now. Those businesses will be defunct within a year. Why? Because black people think white people's ice is colder. Those yeah. businesses will be out of business in a year because y'all will still buy white. If I buy weapons for community defense, y'all be shooting and killing each other in three months because we suffer from the HNIC syndrome. Everybody mm-hmm. wants to participate in the freedom struggle just as long as they're the ones calling the shot. So right. until, you, until you change the mindset of the mm-hmm. American Negro, 
You don't mm-hmm. change nothing else about us. Before there can be an economic revolution, political revolution, spiritual revolution, social revolution, academic revolution, there must be a psychological revolution. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, said what? Mm-hmm. When you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. You don't have to huh. tell him to go to the back door. He'll go to the back door without being told mm-hmm. because the nature of your control over his mind has made itself. And he said when he gets to the back door, if there is no door, he will make one to walk out of. Mm-hmm. Until we liberate the thinking of the African, we liberate nothing else. The Honorable Marcus Garvey said what? Don't take the kinks out of your hair. Take the kinks out of your mind. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's so <laughs> that's true. true. Well, how do you feel about these black cities like Atlanta and D.C. and where it's uh, concentrated blacks just everywhere, chocolate like cities. chocolate cities and all this? Do you think uh, there's any type of uh, growth, you know, as far there's as awareness? Growth. And- there's growth from a capitalist perspective, but there's not growth from an Africanist perspective. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that, if you go to Atlanta, I was just there the day before yesterday, and I love Atlanta, very strong Dr. Umar support city. You have mm-hmm. a strong black middle class, and the black middle class is doing well. But right next door to the black middle class is black poverty. Black poverty. Hundreds of thousands of black people in Atlanta struggling, suffering, homeless, no job. So, yes, the black middle class is doing well. But it's not Africanist because there is no system in place by the black bourgeoisie of Atlanta, D.C., Philadelphia, or elsewhere to reach back and help our less fortunate brothers and sisters. See, in our culture, as African people, in our culture, we do not judge success by the few who made it. See, that's European. Because European culture is based on individualism. So they'll say, look at Oprah Winfrey, look at Tyler Perry, look at LeBron James. You guys are doing better because a handful of Negroes are doing better. That's not African. As African, we look at what is the general quality of life for most of our people. What is the general quality of life for most of our people? To show, for example, there was an article that I read the other day. You okay. said America has just created 100 new black millionaires. That's not progress for black people. That's progress for those 100. There's wow. 50 million of us. There must right. be a program to employ and educate the race, not a whole bunch of bougie individuals. Mm-hmm. That's so true right that's there. You know, true. That's so mm-hmm. true. Man, mm-hmm. We sell out, man. We, we get a couple of dollars. We just start selling out. And we forget our history, where we come from. The nature, why it's even possible. Those who died before us, and uh, man, it's uh, it's bad. It's bad. Well, the only these... difference between slavery and now is in slavery, the white man forcibly sold you to other white men. In today's America, you voluntarily sell your soul to other white men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. We simply barter ourselves, and because they no longer have a need to own you, they simply lease you. They will lease you to exploit your athletic talent. They will lease you to exploit your intellectual talent. They will lease you to exploit your physical talent, and then they throw you back to the ghetto. So they still, it's it's the same system in place. It's just that the names and the system looks different, but it still operates the same. For example, Mm -hmm. Most black boys want to be what when they grow up? Athletes or entertainers. Mm -hmm. LeBron James, as wealthy as he is, his value is based on his what? Physical output. So if LeBron James' value is based on his physical output, and if Tyler Perry's value is based on how much money he can earn, how are they qualitatively, not quantitatively, because they make way more money than our ancestors did, but qualitatively, Mm -hmm. How are they any different from the blacks who were forced to work the fields? Were our ancestors' worth not determined by the amount of money they could earn for the slave system? So how was LeBron any different when his amount of worth is the same way determined by how much he can earn for the slave system, the NBA? That's the only difference is he's getting paid. He's getting paid. Mm -hmm. He's getting paid. But you still Mm -hmm. ain't got no freedom. 
You still can't speak up for your people. You still can't spend your money for the people. You got rappers with 20 cars in their car, in, 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 in uh, parking lot. 20 yep. cars. But you yeah, come from a, a ghetto without a single black school in it. You come from a ghetto without a single black bank in it. You come from a ghetto, okay, without a single black supermarket in it. But you got 20 cars. You know why you got 20 cars? Because every celebrity knows, every black celebrity knows that the white power structure frowns upon black folk with money who try to look out for other black folks, Mm -hmm. which is why most of them do almost nothing for their own people because they know the cost of that can be economic devastation. That's why Mm -hmm. Bill Cosby's sitting in the prison right now, sabotaged by a bunch of ugly white girls because he wanted Mm -hmm. to buy a major network, so they called all Mm -hmm. these white girls together that he dealt with. He should have never dealt with a black man. He to learn how to leave white girls alone, and they destroyed Mm -hmm. that man. This is the number one black TV star in American history. If there was no Bill Cosby, there would have been no Richard Pryor. No Bill Cosby, there would have been no Eddie Murphy. Bill Cosby was the first one to do that. And look yeah, at him now. Destroyed because mm-hmm. he don't know how to leave white women alone. Mm-hmm. Some ugly white women. Mm-hmm. <laughs> ugly white women. Nasty, yeah. nasty white girls. That's true. Just nasty, ugly white That's women right. destroyed him. Yeah, you know, and, sure and he gave to a lot of HBCUs. And oh, man. He donated. Yes, he did. And then Spellman had the nerve to return the unused money from the $20 million that him and his wife gave, the, la- the largest single private donation in HBCU history, okay, and they returned the unspent money. If I was Camille Cosby, I would have called Spellman up, and I have nothing but respect for Spellman, even though it was founded by the Rockefellers, the same family that invented AIDS. But nonetheless, okay, I would have called Spellman up, and I would have said, you're not going to give me the change and the leftover." Since you want to advertise to white folks how much you want to distance yourself from me and my husband, give me my whole $20 million back. But you yeah, don't spend right. $15 million and then say you're going to give back the five. If you want to give the money back, give it all back, not the mm-hmm. leftover change. That's what I would have did if I was them. Mm-hmm. I would have did the same thing. Yep. Yep. Showing off it's, to white folks. We love yeah. to do that, too. I we love, we do that. Yep. And when the Bill yep. Cosby situation went down, listen, I'm not, expect, I'm not asking nobody to lie in public. If you believe Bill Cosby was guilty, so be it. I'm not going to ask you to lie in public. But what I can expect you to do as a member of this race is when you are asked to cast doubt on any member of the race, you simply have no comment. See, I'm not asking you to lie, but I'm asking you to be honorable. With all Mm -hmm. due respect, I'm choosing not to comment on that situation. But these Mm -hmm. Negroes do that. See, Negro, they stuck a mic in their mouth. Felt the need to distance themselves from Bill Cosby to make sure white they folks ran consider them good Negroes so they can get mm-hmm. some more work in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They ran from him. Mm-hmm. Sure did. Yeah, mm-hmm. they sure and did. Look where now, he's at now. He's sitting down up in prison mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sick. So sick and so mm-hmm. sad. Bad because Bill Cosby requires mm-hmm. two aides to do almost anything for himself. He needs mm-hmm. two aides to go to the bathroom, two aides to get dressed, two aides to get put in the bed because he's legally blind. Mm-hmm. He's legally blind, and he doesn't yeah. even want his wife to go up there and visit him because he don't want her to see him in that situation. What they did wow. to that man is absolutely wrong, convicted with no evidence, all hearsay, a case that was previously thrown out mm-hmm. and was resubmitted uh, one day, one day, less than 24 hours before the statute of limitations expired. Mm. That is so That's bad. That's how they do. How they do. Mm-hmm. Well, the system is like when they they're they going to get you unless yeah. we unite. See, mm-hmm. African proverb, sticks in a bundle are unbreakable. You can break any stick by itself, but you mm-hmm. put them bricks in a stack, you can't get to them. The problem with us, because we are a disorganized people, the Honorable Marcus Garvey said what? The greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael said what? If you organize a little, you get a little done. If you organize some... You get some done, but if you don't organize at all, you don't get anything done. Let's look at black America. Black teachers are not organized. Black police are not organized. They're organized with the white police. They're organized with the white teachers, but they're not organized by themselves. Black parents are not organized. Black men are not organized. Black youth are not organized. We are totally at the mercy of whatever our oppressors want to do to us because we are not organized. And the number one reason we are not organized is because we have so much contempt and self-hatred with one another that you can't get 20 <laughs> black folks to come into the same room and agree on what kind of coffee to drink. That's right. That's true. That's we right. talk about that yeah. all the time, mm-hmm. that that hate, yeah. that hate and division that we have in our communities, and we just don't like you because, just because. Yeah. 
And that's one thing that and the white community has got as intellectual analysis. That's how we get away with it. Because we'll say, well, I hear what the brother's saying, but I disagree because of da, da, da. I hear what the mm-hmm. sister's saying, but I disagree because of da, da, da. And we never mm-hmm. get around to getting any work done because everybody feels like they have to look smarter than the next person. And the only way they can do that is by poking holes in what the other person is trying to do. Wisdom is not in the information. Wisdom is in the application. See, the world is filled with knowledgeable people, but the world is not filled with practical people. And the black community has all types of intellectual masturbators. They're all in the black conscious community. They know everything, but they have done nothing. Mm-hmm. Now, now, recently, you know, I've been following you and uh, watching you on various different platforms, man. I saw you on Sway. You know, mm-hmm. Sway Show and uh, Breakfast Club mm-hmm. and uh, Tom Joyner. Tom Joyner. All of Best. these. Oh, man, mm-hmm. you you just everywhere. Real Housewives of Atlanta. But the one that I really picked out and I want to applaud you for holding your own was the Roland Martin Show. Man, you mm-hmm. held your own on that one, bro. You know, and. Yes, uh, that, was, that was very disrespectful what Roland attempted to do. I had been on this show three times before that. And he never demonstrated any disrespect. I believe that the motive behind that, uh, uh, what you want to call that, uh, that uh, mm-hmm. it's a name for episode it. was motivated mm-hmm. by the fact that when I did the last break, I had just did the Breakfast Club interview a week before. And it was mm-hmm. the hottest thing on the Internet, like hotter yeah. than anything. Everybody was sharing it. I mean, every time I go on the Breakfast Club, it goes viral anyway. And mm-hmm. I think Roland had gotten jealous at the amount of love and support and views that the interview was getting. So he took it upon himself to be the person to try to poke the air out of my balloon. That's what that was about. Everybody mm-hmm. singing his praises. I'm going to bring him back down to earth. And he ended up exposing himself, making himself look like a clown. I mean, you got me on national TV arguing with another black woman about why black men should marry black women. That is insane. Uh-huh. That I saw it in insane. <laughs> and the committee tried to get on you too. Those three people that were there, they were trying to ride you as well. And but well, you he held him up to do that. He set him up yeah. to do that. Uh, you, you held him Craig. It, it came out later. He had a white girlfriend, I believe. Somebody sent me a picture of him and his white girlfriend. The other mm-hmm. brother was okay though. The lawyer, he was all yeah. right. He, he he maintained his voice. But Lauren and Eugene and Roland. I mean, oh. three coons in a pod. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous. And ultimately, he basically sabotaged himself because his yeah. show was canceled by the end of the year. And mm-hmm. I believe that was due in no small part to the fact that a lot of my supporters who were News One Now viewers stopped watching him. I got so many text messages and emails from elders and professionals and young black folks who say, yo, I used to watch him every morning. But after what he pulled with you, I'm not watching him anymore. And by the end of the year, his show was off. Yeah, mm. I, I saw that. You know, I've seen that <laughs> that that segment several times. I analyzed it, not yeah. <laughs> yeah, I analyzed. I've seen it a few times. Yeah. That in the Breakfast Club. Breakfast Club was a whole different uh, yeah, interview. They pretty, they pretty. They pretty. I like the Breakfast Club because they allow mm. me to get the content out, and they allow people to make their own opinion of it as opposed to Roland Martin who wants to uh, control the way in which the content comes out, you know, mm-hmm. by his own twisted narrative and interpretations and uh, distorted questioning. So with the Breakfast Club, it's always love when I go up there. Now, I ain't been up. We missed the interview I should have did last summer because I normally go every summer. So I don't mm-hmm. know if they got the word that they can't bring me on there no more because – these Breakfast Club interviews, they go more viral than anybody else they interview, rappers included. Yeah. Like, they really go viral when I do them. So, I don't know why I ain't been back yet with the type of flips and spins that it get, but at the end of the day, it's a white platform. You know, mm-hmm. it's a white platform. And um, although I do control Club is? what I say, because I want to make sure it gets, you know, played. Mm-hmm. So, you're mm-hmm. saying the Breakfast Club is a white platform? I believe it is. Now, I, I do see they have the revolt sign, so maybe revolt is Sean Puffy Combs, so maybe mm-hmm. they are on his platform now. I don't want to speak inaccurately about the situation, um, so mm-hmm. maybe they are under Puff, you know, but be that as it may, it's still a mainstream platform that yeah. probably yeah. really doesn't value 
the unbridled revolutionary black voice because that's what I represent. There's few other black men with doctor degrees who tell the truth about the racial situation the way that I do. I can't name one of them. None of your mainstream scholars tell the truth the way I that can. I do because they work at white universities, want to keep their jobs at white universities. Mm-hmm. I don't operate in those constraints. So when I speak, yeah. I tell the truth. And black people yeah. rely on me to do that which is why I will never sacrifice my soul or my tongue to a paycheck. Yeah. Well, one thing about this platform you're on right now, Dr. Okay. Umar, is the fact that the building is owned by black and um, uh, the business is black, black, blackity, right. black, everything. We tell our stories our and, way. And that's our motto. We tell mm-hmm. our stories our way. And uh, we like to have people like yourself on mm-hmm. this show to give that narrative of truth. Yeah. You know, as long as you're and talking enlightenment. Truth and enlightenment and, hey, just telling it like it really is, then, you know, that's what it's about. Now, Dr. Umar, are you still giving those um, parent teleconferences, the, I think, Tuesday morning? Occasionally. Occasionally. I just did one uh, this past Saturday in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, the morning of the lecture that I did at the fourth annual Nashville Soul Day. Shout out to the Nashville Soul Movement who brought me down there. It was a beautiful event. So I do them occasionally. I don't do them as much anymore because ever since the acquisition of the school, I've been much more busy these days. Uh, Mm -hmm. But for parents and listeners who have questions about their children, uh, they can schedule consultations with me. And they can do that by emailing me at drumarjohnson at yahoo.com. They can also text message me at 215-989-9858. Again, 215-989-9858. They can also call the 800 number, which is 8444-DR-UMAR. That's 8444 drumar So I still do the private ones. I just don't do the free public ones as much because of a lack of time. Okay. Well, that's good, Lisa. You know, yeah. you can call in and email and, and yeah. still get that good guidance from now, you. Now, Dr. Umar, you know, uh, there's been some controversy about where you got your degrees from. Now, we already know you got good degrees, doctor of clinical psychology yep. and certified school psychologists mm-hmm. and all of that. Can you tell this audience, and you guys listen up, this man is legit mm-hmm. with it and where your background comes from? Um. I think I already satisfied that about three years ago. And I'm going to tell you why I say that. Okay. Um, Around 2016, I got a phone call from the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, which is the institution where I earned my doctorate degree. And the registrar office called me and they asked me, and this was intensified again after the Roland Martin interview, because as you remember, one of the um, insinuations he made was that I didn't have a doctorate degree. So after that interview, but even before that, but especially after the Roland Martin interview, which I think was 17 or 18, 17, I guess, um, Mm -hmm. the school called me and they said, we're getting hundreds of phone calls about your degree every week. We're not allowed to divulge any information about you without your permission. Can you give us permission to let these people know that you earned your degree from here in clinical psychology? I said, sure. They asked me before, but I said no, because I'm of the opinion I don't have to prove anything to anybody, and my Mm -hmm. work speaks for itself. And I'm one of the only people in black consciousness with a legitimate doctorate degree anyway. So if you'll question nobody else, okay, why are you questioning me? So my thing was I told them no the first time. But after Rosa Martin, they sought me out again and said, if you could just let us do this, it would stop a lot of these phone calls. So right after the Roland Martin interview, I gave him permission to let people know that I earned my degree and when I earned that degree. Well, guess what? The controversy obviously has not died, okay, with you asking me that, and respectfully so. And it's mm-hmm. ridiculous. What it shows is that the controversy was never about the authenticity of my degree. Why do I say that? Because for the past three years, you can pick up the phone and call PCOM and find out if I got a doctorate. So if you can pick up the phone and make one call, one call, and verify whether or not this man has that credential, why would it still be a controversy? It's still a controversy because the detractors were never interested in the truth. They knew I had the degrees. They were Mm. interested in the sensationalism. For example, the person who started it, 
the person who started the campaign that I didn't have the degrees, the campaign, that I was still in the school money, had no intention of buying the school, the campaign, that I was not related to Frederick Douglass, he was right out of Philadelphia. And not only was he right out of Philadelphia, he was a former co-worker of mine at a charter school where I served as school psychologist. In other words, the very person who knew my credentials is the very person who put out the lie that I didn't have any. So you might say, why did he do that? If he worked with you, why would he tell people that you didn't have these degrees? Because he wanted to be what I was. He published the book. It didn't go anywhere. He tried to start a speaking career. It didn't go anywhere. He started his doctoral program under Malefi Asasi at Temple and African-American Studies. It took him forever to finish. I became what he always wanted to be. And because of his jealousy, he started the campaign that I was not a minister. It came out of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. So that's there what actually a good happened. example of, See, of black it came from home. It came from right here. Wow, it's right there in Philadelphia. You and never stop. Hindsight is twenty twenty. With mm-hmm. hindsight being twenty twenty, I wish I would have got it back then. The reason I ignored it because I said most people know this is ridiculous. I've been saving black kids for twenty years who don't know that. Okay, from California to Texas to Detroit, no one has saved more black children from special ed and ADHD and juvenile detention than me. I don't have to prove this. So I left it alone because I thought the truth was obvious. I didn't know black people were so thirsty for negativity that they would jump behind any negative campaign to destroy the character of someone who does a work that nobody else does. There is no other black person in this country that does what I do, and that is help parents save their children from the school to prison. We have schools. They need to be principals, but who is helping parents outside the school, equipping them with the information that they need to go into that school and save their child? I don't know of another black person that does the work that I do. So I thought because of that, black people would say, leave him alone. He's off limits because the role that he occupies, nobody else is in it right now. But they didn't. They don't care. They didn't care about our kids. If they cared about our kids, they would have said I was still in that school money unless they had proof because this man is trying to open up a school for our children. Something yep. none of y'all are trying to do. None of you are trying to do it. Mm-hmm. But guess what? Hate is stronger than love with Negroes. And wow. they continued and continued. But that's why I was so grateful that God blessed us on February 7th for this year to buy that school. Frederick Douglass Market mm-hmm. Academy Academy. We have four buildings. They are beautiful. They are mm-hmm. modern. They just have to be repaired. The Frederick Douglass building. We have over 16 classrooms. We have a gigantic gymnasium. We have a lunch room. We have a separate gym across the street in the in the Marcus Garvey building. We got 10 classrooms. We got a tech room. We have all the space we need. The whole block is ours. We don't share space with nobody. We got grass in the front, grass in the back, and we still got a fourth building to work with. By the time we are done, the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy campus in Wilmington, Delaware, will be the central black organizing headquarters on the planet. Because one of the things I know traveling the world is that we seldom have our own meeting spaces. I can count on one hand the amount of places I've spoken at that were owned by black folks. On one hand, mm-hmm. and I've spoken on every continent except Australia. I can't even give you five places I've been in that we own. So the acquisition of FDMG is significant, not just for the future of our children, it's significant for us as a people because you have to organize us. And you can only organize us if you have the facilities to do so. And we have the facilities that can easily accommodate over a thousand Africans on any given day. Once we open up that school, the lights will never go out. But I do tell you this, everyone who spoke a bad word against the school, the school campaign or myself will never be allowed in. They have a lifetime ban because it is very distasteful to work against something that's for the benefit of our children. It is very yes, distasteful. Ma'am. So everybody mm-hmm. get negative, get negative interviews, put out negative blogs and posts. It means no need to show up on grand opening day because you mm-hmm. will be promptly escorted out by security. Mm. Now, Dr. Umar, is there a going to be a tuition cost for the students that attend? Absolutely. It's an independent school, so it will be tuition. I don't mm-hmm. know what that cost is, and I won't know until the school has been restored and all operating expenses have been accounted for. So I'm currently working on that. I will not have that number until it's closer mm-hmm. to opening. I would like to keep the tuition at around $500 uh, mm-hmm. per month per child, which is very reasonable. Mm-hmm. And I do think I mm-hmm. probably will be able to do that because we own the school outright. Uh, there's no mm-hmm. mortgage. It is ours. It is mm-hmm. ours. It is the property of the African race. 
entrust to the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. So because we mm-hmm. own it, you know, that's going to put us in a real good mm-hmm. shape because we won't have to worry about factoring in a mortgage uh, with mm-hmm. the tuition. How many students are you thinking about being able to house in a facility? Well, we're going to start with second, third, and fourth grade. That's where okay. we're going to begin. In the final analysis, we're going to be preschool all the way to junior college because, again, mm-hmm. we have the space to do that. So the beauty is we have the space to do whatever we want to do. Being a former school principal myself, um, I do know that one of the challenges that principals come across is outgrowing the building that they're in. That's one of the biggest concerns of principals because you're going to grow as a school, especially if you're doing the right thing. We won't have to worry about growing because we have two schools right across the street from each other. And because mm-hmm. we have two schools right across the street from each other, we may even begin the Girl Academy, the Anna Douglas and Amy Garvey Academy for Young African Princesses. We may be oh. able to begin teaching our young ladies sooner than expected. That was always a part of the FBMG program in 